All right. All right. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Keep Calm. It's Just a Snake podcast. Today we have an awesome, awesome guest. Uh, tried to hit him up a couple different times this year, but we all know how uh, this last year went for everybody. So he is a zookeeper at uh, the Fort Worth Zoo, does amazing work, big, big part of uh, Project Black Python, uh, the Bullens Python book. Serpent in the Clouds, amazing guy, Ari Flagel. How you doing, Ari? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for uh, having me. I'm actually, I've got to correct you a little bit. I actually am not Uh-oh. at Fort Worth anymore. Oh, I, you're not? Uh, no, I was there for 11 years, and I uh, left uh, early this year before the craziness, and um, a very good friend of mine um, is building a new zoo project and um, hired me on, so I'm uh, building a new facility for him. Awesome. It it isn't uh isn't by any chance the guys from uh 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 the DFW uh gosh I'm totally spaced on the name right now the uh DFW Reptarium nope nope, <laughs> nope? Oh, okay nope. Uh, a friend of mine his name is Quetzal Doyer and he uh, owns um, Parque Reptilandia in uh, Costa Rica oh okay. And- yeah, and uh, so he's building another facility up here. So I'm going to be running the facility up here um, when uh, he's not here, uh, and uh, eventually he'll be up here full time with me. So that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, then awesome. Cool. Uh, well, I mean, let's just kind of get right into it. The same question that cool. you've probably been asked eight hundred thousand times at this point. So how'd you get your start in uh, reptiles? Oh, so well, as a kid, I. I mean, obviously, like we, we all were, we were fascinated with dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's the, you know, the closest thing to an extent that we can get. Uh, but I also, you know, I, I've grown up as uh, having asthma. So when I was younger, I couldn't really have like furry pets like most young kids have, you know. So I got, you know, lizards and snakes and that kind of fueled the the fire for the passion that turned into what I do now full time. And basically it never shuts off even when my eyes are closed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get that i know it's constantly thinking about the next thing and what else you can do for sure exactly um, so um are you keeping stuff right now yeah so um we're maintaining the large collection that we're building for this new reptile public facility uh okay. and we also have you know uh between my uh fiance and myself we have a small uh personal collection too and a lot of those animals we're going to be putting into this facility because it's just going to be so incredible so it's a better better option for them to be in a larger en- enclosures and all everything's going to be super slick so sweet that's awesome yeah cool so well then uh i guess we can just get right into it um i know a lot of these uh a lot of the stuff you've ta- uh, is talked about in serpents in the clouds but um so bolens pythons um yeah. i mean why'd you get into bolens uh, so that's a good question. So um, when I was younger, when I was like in my, I'd say early 20s, I'd say, I, I think so. Um, obviously, you know, I, I was fascinated with reptiles like we all are. And mm-hmm. um, I started, I remember looking in uh, one of my favorite books, uh, Living Snakes. It's an old, older book. And I remember seeing this incredible photograph of this black iridescent snake in there. And I was just like immediately captivated. And then I looked as I was looking at it further, I noticed there was like less than a paragraph of any information about this animal in this book. And uh, so then I started researching what I could and, you know, um, there was, and I ran into the same uh, issue that I had prior, which was there is no information for this animal. Uh, It's very repetitive, mostly, you know, you know, they're black, they come from New Guinea, you know, they eat this, they eat that. And a lot of the information was incorrect at the time. So that just built you know, this huge fire in me to be like, wow, this is amazing. There's hardly anything known about this animal. You know, it, it's been, it was discovered in, you know, 1952. And it's like, and now we, and it's, you know, you know, I think it was a uh, late nineties when I was working with, I was like, it's late nineties and there's still, you know, hardly anything, you know, known about these animals. I was like, I've got to get, uh, I got to get more information. And then that just turned into this like addiction. And then from that point on, it's just been Bolins pythons, Bolins pythons. Bolens pythons. <laughs> I mean, nice. I love other species, and I do have a lot of other favorite favorites, rather. But um, like, but Bolens python is—that's it, what I do. It's—it's it's my passion. So, um, 
you know, it's, it started there and it, it hasn't stopped. It slowed down this year just because I couldn't leave the country, which is a real right. shame. And I've been going crazy not being there because I'm missing, I missed the breeding season and we've got, there's females that are on eggs now in the wild. So these are all things that I'd be, you know, recording in all my notes and all my research stuff. So I, this year has been like kind of, you know, I hate to say it like thrown out, thrown out, but you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff uh, with this new facility too. So it kind of works out where it's kind of keeping me busy also. Cool. So have, have you been out there almost every year? Yeah, I, uh, I'm typically there twice a year, and I've been doing this since uh, early 2000s. <clears throat> so I've been going over for 13, 14 years, I, I think. Twice a year? Crazy. Twice a year. Yeah, so I'm there twice a year in the Highlands, uh, and uh, yeah. That's that's absolutely insane, and I know I know you kind of paid your way for it for a good portion of those. Are you still having to do that? It, you broke up a little bit there. I couldn't hear you. Oh, Sorry. Um, I know you've had to kind of pay your way there the, at least the first few times. Is that still something that you are having to do that you're still trying to raise funds through Project Black Python? Oh, yeah. Or... Yeah, all my – so Project Black Python is my research project, and it's projectblackpython.org. So people are welcome to check it out if they want stuff, and you can find books okay. and all that stuff there and everything. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, um, my research is made possible by people with donations, um, so I work with a lot of grant stuff. I have, uh, fundraisers. Um, I have incredibly generous donors. Uh, and these are people that I've just met over the years. And, and my work is fueled by these people, uh, because it gets really expensive going over there and, you know, I'm a full-time zookeeper. So it's, you know, and also running a facility now. So it, it's right. difficult. So yeah, all, all the help helps um, basically uh, with me getting over there and getting to do this and being able to uh, put material out and more data and share more information and everything because everything that I find and, and I discover or describe, I share with everybody. I want to make sure everybody gets the opportunity to understand it and, and experience it as well. I know, I know, I know. It's uh, a lot of, I think a, a lot of your research is really kind of I don't know at this point if it's like the cornerstone of what we know about Bullens at this point, but I know it's, uh, uh, it's a good portion of it. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I mean, it means a lot. Um, I, I, <laughs> I will say a lot of the stuff that I found has really kind of changed a lot of views, in my opinion, of what we knew before, as well mm -hmm. as what we've done in captivity up to this point. And I think a lot of it has helped other people uh, move forward with having some success also. Um and, and that's the the bottom bottom goal, you know, the, the main goal rather is to be able to have success in captivity, to be able to sustain healthy populations and alle alleviate excessive collecting and excessive, you know, uh, issues with animals having to be imported and, you know, and, and, you know, vice versa and all that. We want to have healthy assurance colonies in, in captivity for these animals. Um, so uh, a lot of that information that I've gotten, I, I feel like that it's helped a lot of people um, get to this point. So. I mean, they're still not being, you know, bred to the point where it's like, okay, we got this thing down. I mean, we're having a lot more successes, which is great, great rather, but um, it's uh, it's certainly getting to better, uh, better where it was than before. Awesome. Yeah. I know there's been a few more successes out there. Do you know about how many people worldwide have actually managed to captively produce bolins at this point? Yeah. So that's one of my things. I try to reach out to everybody and anybody that's either touched a, touched a Bolin's Python or has a Bolin's Python to find out what they're doing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if they've had successes, if they've had any issues, things like that, because that's all important. It's not just about success. It's also about problems that we're having to deal with, too, with these animals in captivity. A lot of people think, you know, it's just we got to breed them. No, it's we got to figure out, you know, their every little subtle quirk they have and what it's going to end up to eventually will you know, have success. Um, so there is, uh, there are a handful of people over in Europe that have been able to produce them. There's been a couple people that have produced them consecutively. Um, but they're still at the point where I don't really understand what I did to do this, but they're getting better and better to, to kind of open up that. I know a lot of people say what the key is, but I don't really feel like there's a key. I think it's just, you know, we have to really understand these animals on a captive, a captive side, as opposed to wild, because, Everything I see in the wild is a very completely different animal than captivity. Um, and a lot of that is uh, like learned behavior from the animals when we have them. Um, but there's, uh, so back to the original question. Um, so yeah, there's, I would say there's about five or six people close. I'd say about five people uh, over in Europe that have been able to produce 
um, animals. Um, and then the other majority of them uh, is going to be in the U.S. Um, nothing in Asia yet. Uh, there's been some close attempts, but nothing yet. Hopefully that changes. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's still a very s- small group of individuals that have produced. Um, it's certainly not at a point where we can say we understand their, you know, reproductive biology and captivity or whatever. I know they are definitely like, I don't want to say quirky snake, but they're just yeah. like, they're so different than the vast majority of all the other um, snakes yeah. and kind of a lot of reptiles in general that we kind of just keep um, in captivity, regardless of hobby or on a zoological point. I agree. Yeah, they're very, uh, they're very unique. They have a very small, you know, niche that's out there. And it's like these little micro habitats that they live in. So it's very specific. Um, and they have their routine. And even in captivity, they have a routine where it's they come out, they bass, they go away. That's it. You know, they, they might cruise around a little bit, maybe look for something to eat. But as far as, you know, being super active, that's pretty much what they do. And that's normal in the wild, too. They come out, they bass, they go away. And that's it. So, um, yeah, they have a very specific behavior. Um uh, uh, in the wild and uh, it, it changes a little bit in captivity like I said a little bit earlier but um, for the most part they're you know yeah they're just incredible animals they, they really are I know it's just to be able to see one in, in in even in a zoo setting is just really really rare and it's just absolutely amazing to see them um, yeah so when you sit so you 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 do in fact go to Papua New Guinea to sit to go up into the highlands and that's I think something that people still don't quite get, it's not, you know, like the regular tropical rainforest where you're finding these things, are you? That's at, at pretty yeah. high elevations, right? Yeah. So, so I've never been into Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is on the Eastern portion of the Island. Oh, my, okay. all of my okay. research is over in West Papua. So a lot oh, of people right. get a PNG, you know, Papua, but so all my work that I've been doing for 13, 14 years, I can't even remember now, um, is no. on West Papua, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm very high elevation. It's cold, it's wet, it's not comfortable, it's da- very dangerous, um, and it, it's it's not a uh, it's not a vacation. That's the thing. A lot of people are always like, "Can I go with you? Can I go with you?" Mike, it's not a vacation. I was like, "It's." I mean, I got really really sick last year, uh, and I, I I that was the closest I got to being to the point where I was like, I thought I might not make it out of there. Um, oh wow. Yeah, and that was the uh, I talked about it in the in the book when I found the babe when I came up on the babies hatching. Um, which was pretty absolutely incredible. I finally timed it right. I've been trying to do this for four years and I finally timed the right window and I was able to be there for the babies hatching in the wild. So, um, which is incredible. Yeah. It was, it was like the, it was my moment right there. So it's, uh, but, but it came with a price. I mean, I got really, really sick and I was in a little hut in the middle of nowhere and it was just like, you know, coming in and out of consciousness and sweats and, you know, freezing and, you know, teeth chattering. And it was, it was terrible. It was terrible, but I would do it again if I had to. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I mean, that's where our passions lie. It's you, you do a lot to, for what you love. Um, So I know you go into a lot of detail in the book and um, I will absolutely say anyone listening right now, please, please get this book. It is an amazing, amazing book. Um, Thank you. But kind of, uh, it means a lot. It's great. I, I was I was super bummed when I missed you when I was uh when I was down there I know, in February. Right? I know we uh, can, well I might come down in February. I don't know. I'm still kind of shy around people right now just because of all this COVID crap. But oh, okay. uh, yeah, I might be down there just to say hi, and I'll be in like a a giant bubble or something. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um. Well, I uh, I know you go into a lot more detail in the book about it. So what's kind of like what's the process of actually going there i mean what once you once you can get the funds from donations and through everything else like what's the process of you leaving leaving the dfw airport to getting there and going yeah. in and staying with uh the villagers there and everything else so just, basically uh, i have to it, it's it's about a two days solid travel to it's about oh it's about two days to get to indonesia you know, time change and all that and planes, all that stuff. And so I get in really late on the second day. Um, and then, uh, after that, then I have to, um, 
fly from Indonesia. I usually, I mean, I'll be in Jakarta, so I, I visit friends that are there. And then from there, uh, it's another eight or nine hours to get to Papua. And then um, from Papua, um, once I'm on Papua, then it's about another hour or so to get to the area that um, is like my base camp area t- slash town. And then from there, it's never another several hours to get up to the actual my site that I'm at. So it's it's mostly travel to get there. So you're looking at about a good solid three to four days to get where you're going if there are no hurdles to go through or issues that always present themselves so right like uh um do you ever have any issues with like the indonesian government or anything like that with um, no i'm usually I'm, I'm, there or... no you know knock on wood i've never had any problems with it which is good um because i mean i'm just out there you know hiking and visiting friends and and, and you know photographing these animals and stuff like that um, uh, so i'm not i'm not trying to cause any problems out there and, and you know i'm very matter of fact with what I do and um you know it's taken me a long time to get get to know these people that were enough they trust me to, to let me stay in their villages and stuff too I mean if you were right off the plane and you got off there there's no way in hell that somebody's going to let you come out there it's going to you know they're going to either bleed you for all the money you've got or they're just not going to do anything um so it's uh it's it, it's taken me a long long time to finally get these people to trust me uh, and then they see me every year, twice a year coming back. So they know that I mean, well, and I, you know, I'm no, they know I'm this crazy white guy that just keeps coming back. So they look forward to seeing me. Um, but yeah. And, um, and then getting back is always tricky too. I mean, getting up there, I mean, it's depending on the time of the year, it's just like, you know, the roads are terrible. It's like, you know, I've got to rent a truck and have somebody drive me up there. It's like, it's a lot to get up to these spots. Um, but it's so worth it because, you know, it's what it's what we love to do so it's my passion so it's like you know of course it's, I'm, I'm like stir crazy now because i haven't been able to go back <laughs> right totally get that so um i know that you know a lot of people when they think because it's you know when they think boland's python so the morelia so they think it's kind of like a really big carpet python but yeah not at all no yeah it's well they they switch them over um they, they they reclassified the whole group and they split them up in with the other scrubs because they're the closest, mm-hmm. you know, to them. Uh, I think, I believe it was like scale, uh, head scalation and uh, dentition, I think helped um, place them into Somalia. Uh, so now there's Somalia bull and I, and that was like 2014 uh, yep. where they got reclassified, cr- classified over, but they are typically, you know, they're, they're a member of that scrub complex. Um, they behave a little bit di- more differently than your typical scrub, in my opinion. But um, that's just maybe because I'm biased. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, yeah, they're not a big carpet python by any means. Um, they can be very hardy like a carpet python, um, but um, it's a different animal. All right, and they're and they're you know the needs in the area they come from is so much different too. Like so, when we think about um the carpets and green trees or even the scrubs um just like the temperature and humidity is different like on a vastly different degree right oh yeah i mean to give you an example i mean you couldn't put a a car like a standard a standard carpet python i don't even like to use a standard one just like your typical carpet python in these conditions prolonged periods you know that would be perfectly you know fine for a boland's python you know it's like uh, I mean, last night, my temperature is down, down into the mid fifties right now. And they've been like that for three weeks, I'd say. And, you know, and they're fine. I mean, they're just like, whatever, you know, but if you put a, a different species like a carpet python into that kind of a scenario, you're going to possibly have issues down the road. If you're constantly exposing to an animal to high humidity, uh, the damp environment and those cool temperatures, you're going to have, you know, respiratory infection, like out the door. Um, but these guys are specifically, they're designed for this habitat. This is what they do. And they are incredible at um, living in these these little microclimates, which is just amazing place. That's awesome. So um, so once you actually get to these, um, these little villages that have, which is absolutely astounding that you know, the, everything about the research and the snake is amazing, but the fact that, you know, you have all these stories of these amazing indigenous peoples that have such a rich and 
I mean, kind of violent uh, history. I mean, they're cannibals, right? Like the I yeah, think a lot some of, of these. The- yeah, a lot of these tribal groups, you know, they they used to be cannibals, and that was just the way of life. That was just their that was their belief system. You know, it's like you know, it's it's what they do. Um, but uh, a lot of these, you know, it's like you know, it's a different view on life that these people have it's you know it's get up in the morning it's work out in the fields it's harvest your vegetables your potatoes you know you know take care of the pigs you know and and that's it you know every day is the same typically and then you wander around and walk around and you know see other villages and stuff like that too but um yeah a lot of these people you know used to be you know i hate to say dangerous but, but you know they protected their 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 lands and their places with you know aggression as needed so these people mm-hmm you know, are not keen to outsiders coming into their area unless you're, you know, they know you. So there was, there was, so when you, when you first go there, when you, when you very first started to, to introduce yourself and to try to build this reoccurring relationship, did you have someone kind of from, um, I can't remember the name of the, the city in West Papua, the kind of like the capital there, do you have someone with you? Um, do you have someone take their, did they, did they go with you to these villages to kind of start to establish <laughs> that bond or trust? Yeah. So I have a very, very close friend of mine who, who's Indonesian and he lives in Jakarta and he does a lot of zoo work, um, and conservation work. And, uh, he introduced me to somebody that was over in Papua when I first went out there and then him and I just became, you know, got closer and closer and closer. And he, he was like my, my contact and he's my guide, like my personal guide. Okay. Um, and, um, and I travel there with him when I'm, when I'm out there because, you know, he knows the land the best. Um, he speaks different dialects, which is beneficial. And he knows a lot of, he knows a lot of these different areas because it's like, you know, the, you can't just walk to one place and then another. These are, uh, the areas are owned by different tribal groups. So you've got the Donnie, which are pretty, you know, prevalent in, in the Balin Valley area and all that. And then you've got the Yali that are also there and then the Lani. And so you've got, you know, somebody that's Donnie can't go into a Yali area and vice versa. It, you know, that's, it doesn't work that way. So he's not Papuan, which helps him get through these different areas, but he lives there. So he knows a lot of people. And so he's just an invaluable, uh, uh, well, he's a close friend. He, he's a family. I mean, I've got, he's got pictures of me, of me in his little house, you know, with his kids and stuff like that. And I mean, I've seen his children growing up and all that. So I, I've known him for a long time, but yeah, without him, I wouldn't have been able to start this and, and, and do this work. Uh, certainly uh, not be able to continue going out there. That's all. Awesome. That's awesome. So, um, so you, when you, when you go up there and you are just taking in all sorts of data, correct? About yeah. the, 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 the elevation, the temperatures, the weather, everything. And then yep. all of that goes into like into effect as well as actually looking for the animals themselves. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm recording everything and anything because I don't know at what point what might be necessary or what might be needed or I have a question on it. So I'm literally recording the types of plants I see, the types of rocks I'm seeing. Uh, I tested water last year. Uh, I was checking to see if the water chemistry was different from the area they were at. Uh, I was doing soil um, uh, soil testing. Um, and then, you know, just obviously the the all the measurements and everything that correlate with the animal when i find them you know weights and scalation scale counts all that things you try to do all that but i'm trying to gauge everything and anything that could beneficial or benefit us rather in the long run with maintaining these animals successfully in captivity so um i'm looking at you know wild diet if i can find it i'm looking at the local markets to see what types of mammals people are hunting and selling because those are potential food sources for these animals Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I am looking for everything and anything. Uh, I mean, I'm going through scat if I find it, um, all that stuff. I mean, it's, uh, while I'm there, I'm trying to encompass in, in everything and everything I can get. Just to expand that just knowledge base. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, I, I, one year it was pretty incredible. I went up to this nest area and there was, there was a female out and she was basking, which was fantastic. So I got to come up on this big female basking. I was like just sweating and sweating and just so exhausted. And it's like 67 degrees out and you've got this, this cold sweat going. And I see this and all of a sudden it was just like, 
everything stopped. I see the snake sitting there and it was just like, oh my God. I was like, this is incredible. And it was just like, I was taking in everything that was around, like the position she was laying, you know, what kind of branches were, were she laying on, you know, ridiculous things, but who knows, it could be something, you know, really beneficial. But the real thing was I, I, I looked over and there was like a full skeleton of a Boland's Python, like what? in close proximity to her. And I was like blown away that there was an animal like that, that, that died up in that area so close to a nest. Um, which was super cool. So I took photos of it uh, oh. and, and documented it and everything like that. But it, it's like everything, I'm, every time I'm out there, I'm presented with something new or some new kind of sample that I can look at or a new story or somebody brings me an animal and I've never seen one in this area or, um, or something like that. So it's just uh, everything and everything, man. I'm telling you, I'm a bones addict. It doesn't get any worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> So have you found quite a few uh, individuals out there? Yeah. So my total uh, number of animals I found is 14, I think it is. 14 or 15 animals, I think. Okay. Yeah. Not including the babies that I saw that I, that I saw hatching, which was pretty incredible. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so it, it's, uh, we've gotten real good, real good at finding them, which is easy, <laughs> which sounds funny. Um but uh, yeah, so uh, the the tough part is I've never found a male. Uh, never oh, found a male. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah which is interesting. Oh, sorry, I, I keep cutting you off. Oh, no, I you're apologize. Yes. Um, so I know when I first heard you, I think you were on you were on Joe's podcast um, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, which is where I first heard about you. So and you hadn't found a male then either. So you still, yeah. it's always the nesting basking females. Yeah, I, I'm typically going, I, I, the area I'm at, I'm finding all the females nesting and basking. So I've recorded 14 nest areas um, in the amount of time I've been traveling there. Uh, and some of those nest areas are like within 20 feet of another nest. So they're reutilizing these nests, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, But I've never found a male. Uh, one of these years, uh, I'll, one of these times, I'll, I'll go and, and try to search for a male. But it's, just, it's so hard when I come up on a big female that's sitting in a nest chamber and I'm just like looking at all the chamber and all this stuff and getting temperatures and UV exposure and, you know, the position of how the sun is to the nest and all, you know, it's like stuff like that. But one of these days I'll find a male. He'll find me probably. <laughs> so are you finding the, the same animals every time yeah. you're going up your, it's, it's the same there. Do they ever move from nest site well, to nest site? Or? So for the, I, I found about, for the most part, I'm finding all the same animals for, uh, or animals in that same area also. Okay. Um, but um, this next trip I'll be going to, I was supposed to do it already, but obviously I couldn't travel. I'll be going to a brand new area that I've never been to. That's, you know, a few hours away from my normal spot. Um, and I'm going to start looking over there too, to kind of start branching out to see how far the range I can, you know, keep following and see if I can, you know, just more info, more data, um, you know, more observations and, and thing so it's crazy so i guess that it, that kind of that that really close proximity kind of does explain that you know full skeleton next to that other basket yeah. female they're just so bizarre it was so bizarre i was like wow i was blown away i never never thought i'd find a skeleton i mean let alone that's so that is so crazy so they, it's um so i'm just trying to figure out how to how to move on from here it's just so weird like i would never have thought that's like, so it's so different than what you would normally, I guess, document with snake behavior kind of anywhere right. else. Yeah, um, it was, it was just, uh, I mean, it was a really surreal thing. I mean, to find it, it was, uh, I mean, it was really cool. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they're, pre- they're the predominant predator out there. They're top of the food chain. So it's like, you know, uh, I mean, there's some, you know, larger, like New Guinea Eagle and all of that stuff. And then you know, mm-hmm. people are the only other thing that's going to eat them, but that's a rarity. Not many people eat them anymore um, in the area. So, um, but uh, I mean, the further you go out, they probably would. But yeah, it was just a really odd thing to find. I was blown away. And then, I mean, I found old eggshells and things like that as well in old nests. Uh, I found uh, I found a female. I found two females actually um, sitting on eggs on top of a few old eggshells from the prior season. That was really cool. Um, okay, so yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, so it was pretty um, neat. So when you there when you said they're basically kind of like the apex predators, at least terrestrial predators. So yeah, is their prey base just kind of 
anything, everything? Are they generalists or they go for specific? So they feed, they, they seem to feed predominantly off uh, the couscous, which is uh, a small little, it looks kind of like a North American opossum, basically. Mm -hmm. New Guinea's version of it. Uh, and they're really, really stinking cute too. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, and they feed mostly off of those, which are a decent sized prey at them. Um, but they also feed off of um, small birds, like ground birds that are there. I've heard they've eaten lorries as well from the locals. They've told me, but I've never seen one in person. Um, you know, and there are, you know, ground rodents too. So they're feeding off of those as well. Um, and then also, um, you know, the, the babies uh, are like a whole other thing as far as like being able to find a baby. I've never found a young animal at all. Um, because I mean, obviously they they just disappear into that, that vegetation and they're gone. But, uh, I found like small little tiny, uh, uh, tr uh small little, uh, terrestrial frogs. And I found some small ground skinks as well. So I assume that the, the babies are feeding off of those right off the bat. Um, uh, and then, you know, s little tiny birds during certain times of the year. So, but yeah, I mean, they, for the most part, they stick to what they feed off of that's up there. Um, but, uh, I mean, I'm sure they would eat something random if it came by, as long as it kind of smelt similar, I would say, you know. Okay. So are they arboreal at all? I know they're usually found down in kind of yeah. den and nesting sites. Do you ever find they, them? They'll, climb. they'll certainly climb. I wouldn't okay. call them an arboreal snake when you compare it to like a green tree python or, no. or, or, you know, uh, one of the larger scrub pythons that are found in a arboreal more arboreal setting mm -hmm. but they certainly will climb if they're given the option they will climb um i think the babies have more of a tendency to be arboreal just because it gets them off the ground from like rodents or uh, any other smaller predators that might go for them um so it's just kind of a safer thing for them but i wouldn't say they're arboreal by any means but they certainly will climb if given the chance Okay. I was actually going to, I was, I was going to wonder, like, do you think males are, they're up in the canopy more or? Well, is that see, the, weird, the, the environment is like, you're at the top, you know, there's not much to go up any higher. And um, they're just, I mean, like I said, they'll climb, but they're not going to go out of their way to spend extended periods of time right. in a tree. Uh, I've got a photo from, from my guy who took a photo of one that was up in a tree basking. And it was like, you know, just like in some like heavy, heavy brush, I would say it wasn't like a tree tree. It was kind of like a small wispy kind of tree that's out there. So and it was out there just basking, but it, but it typically that's, that's not a typical thing for their behavior in the wild. Um, it's going to be more or less an observed thing in captivity. It's like, Oh, I saw them up in the tree. I gave them a tree. So they climbed it. Well, yeah, you're going to give a snake a tree. It's going to climb, you know? Okay. I was just wondering, cause I know it seems like they're one of the one of the species that basking and they need that UVB certainly yeah. more than a lot of other species of snakes. So I was wondering if they would utilize up that to, you know, oh, they certainly basking spots or yeah, they they certainly would if they needed the opportunity. But you're not going to find them in the trees as opposed you are on the ground. I mean, okay, makes yeah. sense. There, yeah. that's definitely one of those things that's vastly different than scrubs or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I know you mentioned that, um, you know, the, the villagers sometimes used to eat snakes. Is that like, what's the kind of relationship they have with, uh, with the Bolans there anymore? So, I mean, so obviously everybody knows what it is out there. Um, yes. it's a, an animal that's recognized. It's got, you know, a dozen or a dozen plus local names. Uh, mm. so it's a, it's a known animal, um. There's all, it's also in the folklore, too, with different tribes. You know, they see the animal as, you know, like a bringer of bad news, a bringer of good news. You know, you know, you see one, it's a creation myth, kind of kind of that serious scenario. But, um, you know, in, in some places they do feed off of them. Uh, I mean, I don't blame them. Uh, you know, they're op the, the natives that are out there are opportunistic. So if they come right. across something, that, you know, they might eat it. But. 90% of the time they stay away from the animals as a food source. Um, a lot of the locals are afraid of snakes, so they're not going to bother with it, even though it's, they know it, it's there and it's not going to hurt them. They kind of respect it, leave it alone. It's kind of like one of those things, but um, I do know some places that do still feed, uh, still eat them, um, but not as much as they used to. I know they're, they're, you know, they can be a pretty substantial sized animal too. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. You're talking like a nine to 10 foot animal. I mean, so it's, yeah. you know, if they're out there, I mean, 
have at it. I mean, it's you, you got to survive. So, so I know that they're, they're kind of more at the at the higher elevations. Do they are at, or do they mostly kind of look? For, I don't I don't want to use the word forage. That's not like the correct word. But is it mostly kind of at the lower elevations where there's other species of reptile that are a little bit more prevalent? Like, um, yeah, like I think. There, there are green, there are green trees down in lower elevations in West Papua. Too, yeah, aren't there? Um, I've never found a, con- I've never found any other snakes where I found a Bolan's python. They're always down lower in my experience. Not to say that they're not. I just have never seen one up that high. I've never seen a scrub up that high. Um, I have seen scrubs in Wamina, um, but I've never seen one in a habitat with a Bolan's python. So I can't say they're up there that height. They could be, but I've never seen one personally. Um, but um, yeah, um, the locals, uh, they're at a little bit lower elevation. There's like death adders. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, there, there's an abundance of, you know, of snake life there uh, in lower elevations, just not up that high that I've encountered. So look, I, I guess that makes sense considering, you know, like you said, like extended periods at what would be considered detrimental environment for them, for their health. Maybe it's just like a different time of year is yeah the conditions would be more conducive for some of those other i guess more tropical species of snake yeah exactly yeah um i mean it just gets so it's the the thing with it there is just gets it gets so cold at night and it's so wet so you've got two you got two factors that are really going to play against you uh when you're a when you're a reptile you know you know, you know, moisture and, and cold temperatures. So those don't really work well together, <laughs> you know? Exactly. So, um, so it's hard finding anything really, you know, that size, I would comfortably say that they're the largest, you know, r- the snake that's up there uh, by it, by all means. Um, but, uh, I mean, but they're perfectly suited for it. They're, they're engineered and designed to, to, you know, make, sustain themselves in this habitat. So when I know we've talked about it a little bit, so what are the actual, like temps and humidity that that are at those elevations where these animals are being found like what's the temperature kind of gradient that you would see during like typically when they're out and about or even just high and low day and night temps so uh, the the coldest temperature i've ever recorded was 49 degrees one morning that's Um, pretty cold for a reptile yeah you also have to consider though the snake was not outside in that the snakes are tucked away night down to their nest um and but on average, I'm finding snakes that are out at that low of uh, that mid 60 degree range. Um, and humidity is like 60 to 80 percent most of the time. Um, even in the rainy season, it goes up more. But, you know, and and then they're, you know, they bask for a couple hours and then they're gone. You know, the cloud sense. cover comes over and takes everything away and they pretty much are gone. So, uh, you know, like I said, the lowest ever quarter is 49 on average you're looking at the low sixties, upper fifties, uh, in areas, uh, and then high, real high humidity. Cool. So I know that what you're doing is all in all research of them. You're not collecting animals. Nope. It's all, you're nope. just, you're researching, you're documenting, you're, you're gaining yeah. knowledge, but I know that there are some, some farms, uh, there that do collect. Is that still a, is that gone down at all in the past couple of years or is yeah, there? The, the only thing I collect is data and photos. Yes. Uh, I, I've been asked that uh, by a lot of people. If I go out there, or if, my, if my trips are collecting trips and it's absolutely not, not the case. Uh, no way. <laughs> um, there are farms out there. There are uh, people that do collect them like locals mm-hmm. uh, because it's seen as a commodity. I mean, they can make money off of it, you know? Right. Um, you know, social media is, is super cool, but a lot of a lot of things with social media are terrible. And one of these yeah. things is, you know, a lot of these people over there have social media in some of these towns, and they can go to these reptile places and they can see people are selling a Bones python for thousands of dollars. And they're like, what? It's like, I know where those are. So obviously, they're going to want to go get them and, and try to sell them because, you know, these people are lucky to have 50 bucks a month. So, you know, right. I... I can't say that I blame them uh, because they have to take care of their families. They have to take, you know, they have to feed themselves. Uh, and sadly, a lot of these people don't have any income. So this is, you know, how a lot of that transpires. Um, so it does happen still. And, you know, and that's one of my big, 
my big push is for, you know, captive conservation as well, because this is how we're going to get sustainable, um, you know, populations in captivity by, you know, by working together and trying to figure out uh, ways to alleviate excessive collecting of animals uh, in uh, importation of them coming in because, you know, we, we have enough animals in captivity, in my opinion, we should be able to produce these animals. We just have to figure out the right way to do it. And then we can go from there. Which is why what you're doing is so important considering how yeah. different this animal is than what we've known for the last 30 years about most reptile yeah. keeping and breeding. Um, exactly. Yeah. So do you, th- I'm going, um, I'm hoping to put together as much data and uh, just as much information, as many photographs, as many scenarios that I can put out there for people to say, hey, there it is right there. That's what we need to do, you know, and and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to basically bring awareness to the people I'm dealing with over in the field. And to, mm-hmm. to, you know, that way, they're aware of how important it is to maintain these animals where they're at, to try to leave them alone if we can, and allow me to keep returning to be able to gather as much information as possible to relate it to captive conditions for facilities in, you know, institutions and whatnot. Um, Have you noticed, like, is there any sort of decline or increase on the amount of imports or exports? I mean, it's, I haven't, it's so far above me that I haven't really monitored that at all. You know, there's several hundred of them that are, you know, that are, uh, imported a year i would say so i mean there's there's healthy populations of them in the wild and to be able to say that i don't think bones pythons are rare mm-hmm. you're just not looking in the right place where they're at just that's it so yeah they they have a very special niche and you have to be in the right place to look for them and that's where you find them what my concern is our biggest issue is not them being collected our biggest issue is habitat loss and that mm-hmm. is a reality um because for there, you, there's no reality of telling somebody, oh, you'd be able to collect all the Boland's pythons in the well. It's just not going to happen. It's so vast, so unexplored. There's populations, there's places where nobody has been. So there are safe places for these animals. The thing, though, that we have to really worry about is all this mining that's going on over there, all the habitat loss also that's accompanying that. And that is so detrimental and just devastating to these animals. And not just Boland's pythons, everything out there, the people the birds, the plants, everything. Because, you know, they're finding all these precious metals like copper and gold and silver, and they'll bulldoze a whole mountain. And every time I go by, I see a new mountain just torn down every time. And I just thinking to myself, what animals we could have, what animals we lost that we could have potentially saved by not allowing this habitat loss out there. Right. Oh, man, that's, that, that was going to actually bring up that next is yeah. with habitat loss is the biggest thing for any and all wild population um is that was that a huge issue facing them right now and yeah, yeah. kind of like yeah everything. every year I'm, I'm back you know I, I see change i mean it, it just human nature is how we grow you know we're we're a plague in, in, in a sense you know um and they just keep you know pushing the mountains further 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 and further and back so it's these areas you know are you know they just get devastated and there's no way for them to recoup because you know they're you know taking everything there and that's our that's our biggest threat from these animals or for a uh, threat towards these animals is habitat loss and you know and, and mining and everything i mean obviously over collecting and, and stuff like that does take its toll uh however the biggest thing is these habit the habitat loss and the uh, encroachment on these areas yeah that's what we're seeing all over the place unfortunately yeah, it's um, not just any, it's all over the world. I mean, and that's just the reality. Which is why, you know, this is so important for captive population breeding. Um, yeah. Have there been uh, any success in, like, in the zoological stand? I know a lot of the Bolin reproduction has been in, in essentially in private yeah. hand. Like, I know, I think Frederick, he's probably, what, the the most, Five. he's probably been the most successful? Five times. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Five times. And and I was talking to him earlier today, actually, and, and he still he still is not convinced on what the trigger is. He knows what he does and what he's does what he has done has worked. However, he had last year he didn't have any success, and he did the same exact thing he did. So he doesn't know. Um, but 
as far as I'm concerned, he's had the most success with these animals in re, on a reproductive aspect. Um, and he's a great friend of mine. I mean, it's just, uh, he's just, he's a wealth of knowledge and, uh, um, uh, very, very uh, accommodating with sharing information. And that's what it should be about. That's what the industry should be about. Uh, right. What we're doing, because there's things, I mean, we're, we're way past a monetary thing. Now we need to be able to sustain animals because it's, it'll only be a matter of time before we can't have them legally or we can't have them because they're none left. Um, exactly. Yeah. But so um, to, to answer your question also, so th there have, there has never been a, uh, captive success uh, with reproduction resulting in eggs and viable and viable eggs um, in an AZA institution. It's always been a private sector. Um, so, with that being said, uh, you know, working in in the zoo uh, zoo field AZA for over eleven years, a lot of that is because a lot of it is very controlled. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of micromanagement goes on and I'm not trying to bash, bash the AZA or the, you know, zoological community. It's just, it's a very controlled setting um, where in private, in the private hands, um, a lot of us will see something and be like, this isn't working and we can change it without, a, without having to report to somebody above us to change it or to right. do something, go through a whole list of a, you know, a board of directors or whatever or not. You see something, you change it, you do it. Um, and I, that's that's how we're we're able to have success with you know in captivity because these privates are, are are doing it that way. So, and I know out of the the literal handful of people that have managed to reproduce these things successfully, they all keep them a little bit differently too, don't they? Yeah, it's it's kind of all over for the. I mean, there's there's similarities, but they're different, right? Um, Myself, I'm trying. I, I try to go as natural as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've got very naturalistic enclosures. Um, I have, you know, uh, my temperatures. I'm trying to replicate as close as I can. My humidity. I'm trying to replicate as close as I can. And then you have somebody that does it completely opposite in a very simplistic, you know, newspaper cage, and they have success. Um, so it's a very interesting scenario. Um, uh, getting bulls to breed. I mean, I had a lockup this afternoon. Um, so, I mean, getting them to breed is not hard. Bulls, pythons like to copulate or males <laughs> like, to copulate. um, getting females to ovulate and go that extra distance is the issue. And there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, providing what they want and, 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 you know, and there's been some success with that mentality. Uh, so hopefully we'll see more and more of that, you know, presenting itself i have a feeling we'll start to we'll see some some more success this coming uh year I'm, I'm hoping fingers crossed cool that's really really cool it's just always it's always been like you know that unicorn for everybody in the hobby yeah. so it's just i was wondering Incredible. regardless of being able to reproduce them or not they're just absolutely amazing animals to to interact with and observe uh, but ultimately, we want to be able to reproduce them to be able to sustain these populations, you know. Right. Um, and uh, and I hope to be I hope to be able to do it once. I would just like the opportunity to do it once uh, to you know to say I was able to reproduce them one time. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I can accept that. Um, right. But I will not stop trying, and I will never stop working with these animals because of that. Uh, it's just I was. I was put here to work with bolts pythons. That's the way I look. <laughs> nice. Uh, how many years have you been? Uh, have you been really attempting to reproduce them? Uh, I would say the last eight years, I've been I, I've been pushing uh, harder to really work with them. I mean, I, I've got a decent group of animals um, that I've been working with, um, and uh, which help. You know, greater numbers obviously are are, are help. You know, help out a lot, um, but. Um, you know, I'd say probably the last eight years I've been really, really pushing it, really trying to relate what I've been observing in the wild and how to get it into a captive setting. Also talking with everybody and anybody, getting, you know, opinions and ideas and, and not just with Python people. You know, I'm talking to monitor guys. I'm talking to tortoise guys. I mean, because there could be some little thing I'm overlooking, you know, that could be, you know, beneficial on an aspect of caring for something else that might correlate to what we're doing with these guys. Because um, it almost seems like their behavior is similar to like lizard or tortoise behavior ba versus a lot of other like bowed snakes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So crazy. Um, 
I don't know. It's just so weird that it's they're just such a cool animal that's just so different that yeah, just they're don't very know a whole lot about. Yeah, the best way to put it is they're just different. You know, it's you know right. I almost feel like it's a small little mirror, kind of reflecting the hobby a little bit. While like we've known about it for a little while, but not a whole lot. We've really only gotten started, like keeping reptiles in the last like truly like expanding herpticulture in the last like 20 years yeah. and then you know with Bolin's 1952 they're discovered 40 years went by before any real research yeah. or efforts to produce them captively happened yeah the only downside I mean Bolin's also go through like they go through a phase the Bolin's phase where popular <laughs> animals starts you know building up and everybody wants to get a Bolin's python because they want to be able to one to do it and they want to be able to reproduce it and make a million dollars and i'm like you're not going to make a million dollars from breeding Bolin's pythons you know it's like and and sadly they've i mean in my opinion they're worth a million dollars because they're what i absolutely love and i look at them as absolutely incredible animals you know but they they get associated with a high monetary value because of what they, what they are and because they're not commonly reproduced. And sadly that turns around and bites, bites, bites us in the ass. Yeah. Um, and and uh, unfortunately it shouldn't be about that. However, you know, it happens. Human nature. Exactly. Human nature. We're our own worst enemy. So uh, that's no better way to put it than that. Um, yeah. So, meh. um, well, with that being said, um, are you able to kind of expound a little bit about what you are going to be working on with your new venture of setting up your, uh, this new facility? Yeah. So this, uh, this, Oh, you were, we're hoping to be open in the beginning this coming year, March, April, I hope, you know, give, give or take. Um, it's a, uh, a three building a facility currently. Uh, okay. there's a, a Interior with you know quarantine rooms, large gift shop, a huge museum, educational area. Um, then it's got a two-story tropical building um, and a large temperate building as well. Right now, uh, obviously, we'll, we're going to plan to expand uh, probably in the next couple of years uh, with some you know some more buildings too. Um, but uh, the collection is going to be you know just incredible species, not not the not things that are necessarily the rarest. But animals that are displayed correctly, animals that are behaving correctly, uh, correctly, and a lot of mixed species. So we can see these animals interact daily and see um, observations that we wouldn't normally do. So we're, we're focusing heavily on the animals, you know, mm-hmm. and, and education, uh, correct education. Um, it's it's going to be incredible. It's going to be a really, really special place. And it'll be a destination place uh, where we'll be set up for symposium stuff and, you know, educational awesome. areas. So. You're making, you're, you're convincing me to move down there at this point. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, I mean, is it um, mostly indoor facilities? Or are you going to have eventually expound out to kind of like maybe indoor outdoor areas? So that way they have kind of access to. Yeah, so we have currently everything is indoor. We do have outdoor access for several species, so they'll be able to go outside when the weather's nice. Um, and uh, eventually, we'd like to do a uh, a large crocodilian thing that's going to be outdoors. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's going to be all indoor uh, with a little bit of outdoor stuff. So, uh, like I said, okay. mostly it's going. Uh, but it's going to be really. It's just going to be fantastic. I mean, a, a lot of really. A lot of really great species we're working with that not necessarily are the rarest in the world, but they're just going to be, you know, they're going to be displayed how they should be shown. And, and, you know, and we hope to do, you know, a lot of conservation work with, uh, you know, with various institutions and organizations um, and all that. So it's awesome. Um, yeah. Where exactly is that going to be? Um, so we're 40 miles we're, or not 40 miles. We're about, well, yeah, about 40 miles, 40 minutes or so uh, outside of Austin. Oh, okay. And, uh, so a little bit further yeah. south. Yeah, yeah. And we're in the hill country, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to be out in this area out here. Um, and uh, like I say, uh, we'll probably be opened up, you know, give or take March, April. I'm, I'm fingers crossed, hoping. Um, right. uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be pretty impressive. Uh, obviously, we're going to we have a big bowl in enclosure, of course. <laughs> uh, Go figure. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, go figure, right? Uh, you know, but a lot of water, a lot of, you know, a lot of movement, things like that. We're going to have a lot of that stuff. We want it to be real interactive for people so they can, you know, really enjoy everything. It's not just going to be looking at one big snake in the enclosure. There's going to be small little frogs and little lizards and fish and crayfish and, you know, all sorts of things that are going to be interactive and people can be able to, to see how it, how it responds naturally, you know. That's all cool. I guess yeah. I, that's definitely something that I would like to see more in a lot of places instead of just here's this one enclosure and while it is set up immaculately and yeah. it gives a lot of things that you would maybe be able to see that replicate the wild, but not multi-species inhabiting yeah. different areas that won't necessarily eat each other, but would yeah. be found in the same areas that would in fact interact on a daily basis. Yeah, exactly. We have a really cool uh, European enclosure with European pond turtles in it and uh, the uh, Tim on, uh, Time on Lipida, the, uh, I always forget, the green lacertids and the uh, uh, Sheltapusic, which are the legless, giant legless lizards. And uh, we've got like Italian wall lizards. So it's going to be like a lot of really cool interacting species that would be in the same habitat together. And our exhibits are huge. So they're going to be able to not be like, it's not going to be like inside an elevator. These There's going to be lots and lots of space for these animals to just do what they do. So it's going to be really exciting to see all the interaction and just everything. Um, I know not everybody's been there, but it, it kind of, it sounds like you're kind of almost describing like the the water dragon exhibit at the Fort Worth Zoo, where it's that huge, huge wall where it's, I think it's a water dragon. Was it a water dragon or a sailfin dragon? Might have been uh, we, 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 there was a sailfin dragon. There was also caiman lizards as well. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it's it's a huge enclosure that's similar to that. Okay. Uh, that kind of a style, that feel to it. So it's going to be like aquatic and dry land. So it'll be encompassing both, you know, terrestrial, aquatic, arboreal things like that too. So that's just really cool. Um, do you, have you guys decided on a name for it already? I don't know if uh, you it, might have said it. Uh, Reptilandia Reptile Lagoon. Reptilandia, Reptilandia Reptile Lagoon. Yeah. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah, it'll be fun. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be really cool. Uh, I'm super looking forward. I, if I if I can, I would I'd love to come out there and check that out because it sounds of course. Really more than cool. more than welcome. So, um, I think that just about covers everything I had for you, and I really appreciate you, uh, you know, giving time for this. I know you've, I'm sure you're busy like everybody else so really appreciate yeah. you giving me the time to do this my pleasure thanks for you know i appreciate you reaching out it's always flattering to come and talk to people i always enjoy that so cool um well as you said before um you know projectblackpython.org um is that the best place to learn more about the about the bolens python and um about your research and the project for that yeah, um, I also have a really great uh, Facebook group uh, that I put together with a lot of keepers from all over the world. Everybody's sharing info and updates and all that, too. And I can go ahead and I can send you the link to that after we're done doing the interview. So you can, you know, post it up if you want. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and then, you know, just if you want to talk snakes and bowlings. You find me online. I'm always up for talking about bowlings. <laughs> True. I mean, I was definitely like that weird guy that went, hey, I'm. Some random guy from the internet. Do you want no, to no, chat? You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you're, yeah, right. You're you're fine, man. I it, like I said, it's flattering to me, and I I'm, I'm like one of the hum most humble people you'll ever meet. So it's I always enjoy it. So it's nice. Well, it was really great to talk to you too. So um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, you know, everything goes for you. You can make it out to West Papo again next year. The yeah. awesome facility opening up and everything goes well for kind of everybody coming in the following year and everything. Leading yeah, no, we need it. We need something positive to look forward to. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for tuning in, everybody. And we will check you next time. Thank you so much. Be safe. Right. <laughs>